viewers as well. Helen, 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 can we remind people to mute, to mute if they're not speaking? They're not speaking. To avoid the very issue we've just demonstrated. Yeah, very good. That's a helpful reminder. Thanks, Jane. And just before we start also, if we can just apologise to governors, there's been some problem with, for some governors, with papers for today. There's been some gremlins in the system. Um, so for those that have been affected by that, um, apologies. And we will obviously redouble our efforts um, to um, sort it out. I'm pleased to say that I saw my set earlier in the week and when I went to look for them today, they had disappeared. So I too had a moment of panic with um, Nicola around lunchtime, but we've managed to find a, another set on another device. So um, I uh, have had a little taste of the, uh, of the, um, the issue. So um, apologies, but we'll do our very best to sort it out for the next time. So I think we might uh, declare the meeting open, press the record button, and um, say good afternoon and a very warm welcome. Um, we've got uh, we've got a number of apologies uh, this afternoon. I think it's reflective of the fact that we're absolutely fully and firmly in the middle of holiday season. And I'm just going to go to Nicola to record those apologies for us, please. Oh. <laughs> I've got horrific IT issues at this end. I am so sorry. Well, don't worry, Nicola. Because uh, can you come back to me? My screens keep going blank, and it, um, I've got no screens. I can't I see anything. I come back to you shortly, <laughs> Thank um, you. and we record the apologies. Or failing that, we'll record the apologies in the minutes, and that will take. Thank you. Yeah, that will take the pressure off, Nicola. So uh, don't worry about that at all. Um, also, to say a very warm welcome to Andy and Katie uh, from KPMG who are joining us today. You're very welcome. It's just going to be me, Chair. Sorry, uh, oh. Katie. Uh, uh, Katie wasn't available this afternoon, so uh, it's just me. Apologies. Okay, good <laughs> to have you. I'm sure you'll be splendid, even on your own, um, Andy. <laughs> and you're very welcome. And we're going to take your item first, as you've requested. Um, okay. But not before uh, we note the fact that this is the final meeting after nine years distinguished service by both Beverly Webster, who has been the Deputy Chair and Senior Independent Director, and uh, for Alison McKenna, who's the chair of our Finance and Performance Committee. Um, and despite the fact that they've both asked for a very low key uh, departure, I'm afraid we've only been partially able to comply with their request. Um, so we have other colleagues joining us a bit later in the day. So we're going to wait until later in the meeting to say our thanks, but definitely want to record for the minutes um, our vote of thanks and appreciation for your distinguished service of which there will be more um, of that um, shortly. Um, so that brings us, if we may, to declarations of interest. Um, if there are any um, changes to the register or any declarations in respect of today's agenda, could I ask you please to indicate? It would appear not. Um, and I'm assuming that we don't yet have any verbal questions from the public. It's quite early on in the meeting, but just to say to members of the public who may be joining us uh, live now or joining uh, by looking at the recording later. Um, obviously, we're trying to be very flexible in these COVID times. So do feel free to put your questions in the chat. And if you have any, we will again return to them at the end of the meeting so that we have uh, an opportunity to hear from you and respond to you in as close to real time as we can manage in this uh, digital environment. Um, so that brings us on, please, if we may, to the um, KPMG report. Um, Lee, can you tell me, are we straight across to Andy or was there any uh, context you wanted to set? I don't think there's a huge amount of context. Obviously, it's a critical role of the governors in terms of the appointment of the external auditors. The external auditors come back on an annual basis to explain what they found in reviewing our report and accounts. And with that, I, I can hand over to Andy, I think, Helen. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. Um, I just, you've all got the pack. Do you, do you, you don't need me to pull this up onto the screen or is it going to come? Oh, Nicola's done it. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So yeah, so as I said, this is um, this is, and as Lee said, this is our presentation of the work that we carried out for the 2021 external audit. Um, and if we just flip to the next page, please. Yep, 
so the agenda is just look we'll go through uh, our responsibilities and then the headlines of our work and the headlines will cover um, the four areas uh, if we just flick over again please the four areas of financial statements the value for money work the whole of government uh, accounts work that we did and the annual report that you produce and the work that we uh, look to cover as part of reviewing that so just again just flick again so the and uh, one additional piece that we've had to do this year which is new and will be carrying on into the future is to produce an auditor's annual report an AAR um, so this is produced in line with the code of practice which the uh, National Audit uh, Office issued earlier in the year and it requires us to produce a document that is public facing so it takes away all of the audit and accounting jargon that we have in our ISO 260 which Lee and the audit committee love but uh, maybe members of the public don't so much. <laughs> um, so it summarizes uh, the key findings from our work. It includes a detailed commentary on the value for money work we did, but in plain English. And as far as a bunch of auditors can put it into plain English, we did that, I believe. And that has uh, that will go alongside your annual report and be published on your website. Nicola, if, next slide, please. So the financial statements, we look at the accounts uh, and make sure that they're properly prepared in accordance with the accounting standards. And we go through that in, in extreme detail, as you could imagine, as, a, uh, as part of our audit. And then we look to see that the accounts are true and fair um, in terms of the financial performance and the position of the, uh, the trust of the year end. The good news there is of the outcome of our work. We issued an unqualified opinion in 2021. Um, and that means that uh, the accounts do give a true and fair view of the trust performance during the year. We found one material error in terms of the balance sheet, but that was a reclassification within liabilities, so no bottom line effect at all, no issues for yourselves. And one low priority recommendation raised in respect to segregation duties. So nothing of particular concern at all, all reported to the audit committee and all taken through the accounts uh, through Lee and his team. Next slide, please. Value for money, this was a, a larger piece of work this year, first time we're going through in such detail um, and it will continue into next year. The good thing as part of the additional work that we did uh, as part of this year is that all of that information is now collated by yourselves. It's all in one place. So in terms of moving to next year, it'll be a case of tweaking as opposed to producing all of the information for us uh, again, which was a huge task for Lee and his team and again thank you for from us in terms of producing great working papers both on financial statements and on value for money um, and the great news there again is that from that increased uh, assessment of uh, looking at the risks and the, that you face as, uh, as an organization we were able to comment that we have no sorry just onto the next slide please Nicola in terms of the uh, the three areas that we look at we were able to con uh, um, report back that we identified no significant weaknesses in terms of the trust arrangements to delivering value for money. Uh, we carried out that detailed work on financial sustainability uh, because that was the biggest risk that we saw when we carried out our risk assessment. Given the amount of work that the NHS has to do, the amount of work CRH has to do, given the amount of issues that the whole of the system has in terms of funding, we had to identify that as a risk. But when we went through all of the work and we looked at the work that you do as an organization, I was happy to be able to report that we found no significant weaknesses in terms of how you um, go about managing that risk and the arrangements you have in place. So that's really good news. On the next slide, whole of government accounts. Here we are asked to, to look at the trust uh, submission back to NHSI and make sure that it is in line and it is uh, reflective of what we know and again from our uh, work that we did we issued an unqualified uh, consistency certificate which means that there are no issues and again that's fantastic news on to the next slide and then the annual report you produce the annual report we look to make sure that that is consistent with what we know of you as an organization and we confirm that it uh, it fully complies with the annual reporting manual as well and in all of those uh, circumstances where we identified no issues, no material inconsistencies, and we were able to report that it is consistent and we have no issues again. All of that negative reporting in terms of we found nothing and we had no uh, significant weaknesses sounds quite negative, but it is really positive and certainly isn't the message I've given to some, quite a few of my other NHS organisations. So that is a, a fantastic uh, set of uh, results for yourself 
from us, from our work that we did for, as part of our 2021 external audit. On to the next slide, which I think is just for Q&A, Chair. Yeah. So again, whilst it was a zip through, it is because there were no issues to report and it was a really good working relationship we had with Lee and his team in another second year of, high, of remote working, which was quite difficult this time. The first year was difficult in itself, but everyone, we'd already done our planning and our interim work on site. And then it was just the final accounts that was uh, remote. This year, everything from planning to interim to final accounts was all remote. And our teams found that quite difficult. I'm sure to Lee and his team, you know, uh, found it a bit more uh, difficult uh, working remotely completely. Um, and hopefully next year, if we're still your auditors, then we will be working on a hybrid basis where it will be partly on site, partly in the office. We'll never go back to 100% on site. It's just the world has changed and technology doesn't require us to. But again, it's a big thank you to Lee and his team for, for the fantastic working papers that were able to be produced first time for us every time we asked, which is good. Um, can I just add my uh, thanks to those you just expressed to the team and, and indeed to yourself and your team, because it's lovely. It is really lovely not to be sitting on the edge of your seat at this <laughs> point in the year, isn't it? Yes, and absolutely. And to be getting yeah. such a clean bill of health. Um, and it, it's credit not only to the um, to the uh, strong focus on process and compliance and all of those very important things, but I think it goes to the heart of culture too. Yes, indeed. Um, and it's all about um, good culture supporting good governance and vice versa. Mm. Um, so I think um, governors can be taking great comfort from uh, what they've heard today, but also uh, need, I think, to um, afford yourselves a moment of congratulations because it is through your scrutiny and oversight also that we find ourselves in this position of having good governance and a culture that supports, um, uh, you know, uh, compliance and a focus on things that really matter. Um, so uh, yes, it's a it's a it's a happy moment um, in what has been a difficult, uh, as you say, two Absolutely. years. And yeah. mm -hmm. um, now I suspect that doesn't necessarily um, suggest that there will be no questions. And in fact, we've already been put on notice of <laughs> one a bit earlier. Um, so let me just open up to questions, thoughts, or comments whilst we have Andy with us, please. David, I think you had a question with regard to the order that you wanted to come back to. Is that correct? David Lyon. I got the impression you wanted to raise something on the external Lord. If you do, now is the right moment. Yeah, forgive me. I've got a load of papers here and I picked up the wrong one. <laughs> story of my life <laughs> you know i also don't like what we're doing in the sense i'm not entirely at home as you can gather with the way we're conducting our meetings but i realize it's the only way we can do it however my observation on the finance side was I am sure, and in view of what I've just heard, we have covered all kinds of avenues that uh, result in Finance Reporting Council and other people getting involved. And we're not making the mistakes of Tesco. Yeah. Uh, part of, uh, sorry, just quickly, just to come in on that, I mean, part of the fiasco with the Tesco accounts was about them taking income early um, um, and not recording the expenditure in the same year. One of the things that we had to look at as part of a COVID uh, year and COVID-19 was about that fraudulent revenue recognition and or fraudulent um, income recognition in year. And we spent quite a lot of time looking at that at CRH, not because we thought there was an issue at CRH, but because there is an issue across the NHS because there was so much extra funding put into the system. And we put a lot of work into making sure that the expenditure that went through the accounts was correct and appropriate and the income being uh, recorded was in the right year. Because again, 
you know, there was a lot of money put in by the Department of Health and Social Care and the NHSE and um, through the ICS, etc. So we had to make sure and I had to make sure my team was robust in its challenge of Lee and his team in making sure that it was accounted for correctly. And the unqualified audit opinion is one page, but it does say a lot of the work that goes behind that that justifies that one signature that I put to that and I can guarantee that you are not in a Tesco situation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you, David, for that question. Okay, um, thank you. Any other questions on the external order? No. Uh, well, Andy, thank you again. And um, please okay. convey our thanks to Katie and to others on the team. Um, okay. it's been it's been a, it's been a pleasure working with you again. <laughs> We're very grateful uh, for your um, well, Lee's Lee's nodding. <laughs> I, I'm sure it's been a mixed pleasure, uh, but we uh, we enjoy the level of uh, we enjoy and enjoy the level of scrutiny you bring to things as part of another really important uh, element of our assurance landscape. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, now, Lee, I'd like to go to you, if I may, please, just to continue on with the issue about external audit and uh, the changes that were mooted in the context of the um, the joined up care Derbyshire system requirements, please. Thank you, Helen. No, th there's been some contention over the last year about the extent to which KPMG can continue as our external auditors, and that's been based upon the prospect and potential offer of KPMG doing some advisory work to the ICS around our integrated care system development work. Um, I'm very pleased to report in actual fact that um, we're not sure at this stage whether or not we're progressing that KPMG advisory work in the ICS, which would have disbarred KPMG from being our external auditor for 21-22. So we're currently regrouping in the ICS space about thinking through what we do need in terms of potential support around ICS development. And at this particular juncture, it may or may not be KPMG are going to help with that advisory work. So I'm, I'm very pleased to confirm, as of today's date, which is a bit of accounting speak that Andy will be familiar with, um, we can absolutely retain Andy and KPMG as our external auditor if that situation changes after we've been through a process of potentially selecting something to help with some of that ICS advisory work, we may need to regroup. But as at today's date, Andy can, and his team can carry on doing the goodly job they have, um, not least because it's somewhat difficult at the moment to find a different external auditor, because candidly at the moment, that marketplace isn't somewhere people are vying to get into in terms of it being quite high risk work and for the NHS particularly, not enormously well remunerated. So, so I'm very pleased to keep Andy on two levels. A, we've got a bloody good working relationship with him and his team. And B, also because it'd be damn hard to find a replacement in short order, which currently isn't a prospect. So hopefully that helps with the governors. Previously, we talked about how would we get some governors involved in the selection process. We can now that, do that at a slightly more leisurely pace because with luck, we'll be looking for a new external auditor for 22, 23 onwards. So hopefully that's a helpful update, Helen and the wider governing body. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, so that's helpful. Now, Andy, you're obviously very welcome to stay, but if you have other things you need to do this afternoon, we shall absolutely understand um, if you need to leave. Them. <sighs> Afraid so, but all the best. Thank you. Lovely seeing all of you. Stay Take safe. Care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, so now we're going to go back to the top of the agenda and take things in the order set out, um, starting with Angie's Chief Exec Briefing, please. Thanks, Helen. Um, and I just wanted to do a, a hot off the press update on the COVID um, position. Unfortunately, um, things are, are escalating again. So the current position, as we wrote it last week, it has changed. Um, and our numbers of COVID patients in, in the hospital um, are at 12, with two of those in ITU. Now, clearly, that's not the same numbers that we saw at the height of the, uh, the last peak. Um, but at the moment, uh, it feels like all the uh, worst things in the world are colliding. So COVID uh, numbers are increasing. Um, our emergency activity has been unprecedented. So our ambulance service saw record numbers um, this Monday, along with uh, every other ambulance service across the country. And last Tuesday, they said the same thing about the previous Monday. 
So every time we think we can't see any more um, patients or have any more 999 calls, they are continuing to increase. Um, the ambulance uh, crews are doing a fabulous job at um, supporting all patients as quickly and as well as they can with the access to community services. Um, and they're only bringing in about half of those calls uh, as patients to A&E. Um, clearly, when the patients need to come, they come. Um, and so we're seeing an increase in numbers of patients coming through our ED as well. Generally, um, poorly patients, uh, not a lot of patients that don't need to be here in inverted commas that sometimes people ask us, is it patients presenting because they can't get access to services elsewhere? Um, we haven't done detailed analysis yet, so please don't quote me. Uh, but at the moment, um, most of our patients are needing to be here. Um, and please, again, don't ask me why it is. <laughs> There's a few, few things that are obvious in terms of um, pandemic having um, uh, eased a little bit, people feeling comfortable in presenting, uh, COVID numbers increasing. And as you'll have seen on the, the news this morning, tends to be in younger populations. So them having to present um, to services that maybe normally they wouldn't do. Uh, the heat at the moment, we've seen an increase in um, cardiac and stroke conditions, which, uh, again, we know we do see in, in extreme heat conditions. Um, mental health presentations, um, acuity of those at the minute. Uh, we've had some really difficult cases over the last couple of weeks for our, D, our ED staff and all our staff to, to deal with. Um, so that whole combination of... Um, a presentation of patients and they say we're not alone this is uh, replicated up and down the country um, and at the same time a number of our staff um, off either sick or isolating um, and despite some tweaks to the isolation guidance on Monday um, for health and care staff not making a huge difference the time you've risk assessed everything and worked through uh, what it actually means for individuals um, we're at 7.8% staff absence at the moment, three, just over 3% of that being COVID related, either illness or, or um, isolating. Uh, so um, just wanted to appraise governors of the, the real challenging operational pressures at the moment. Please bear with us. Um, our focus is, as always, to look after our patients and to look after our, our staff. Um, it's been a, a tough old um 18 months and every time we say that it feels that it gets tougher uh, and it will be for a while longer so lots of health and well-being support for for all of our staff continues to to be in place um, and I'm not going to go through the report but you'll see that I um, try to keep my uh, usual optimistic self going and some of the fabulous innovations and awards uh, that we we've seen uh, despite everything going on hopefully you've got some, a bit of information there in the report and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Angie. Um, as you say, a difficult time and a magnificent team effort rising to those challenges. Um, Norman. Hi, Angie. Um, just a question, please, on, on the 12 that you've got in the hospital at the moment. What, what's their age group and have they been vaccinated or not? Hi, Norman. I haven't got exact details. Uh, one of the positives this time of COVID is that our patients um, have, are having much shorter length of stay. So by the time I've got round to working out which 12 it is today, it'll have changed um, by tomorrow. So uh, we are doing that analysis. Um, and I was on a call with um, Derbyshire MPs this morning. They asked the very same question. Um, and we were on a regional call and said, um, can we have some support? And we, we should be doing this from a, a public um, health data point of view. Just trying to, I can tell you broadly that it's all age ranges, but tends to be uh, the younger. And by that, I mean the um, uh, below 50s, 60s. Um, so not the, the uh, elderly population. Um, but as to whether people have been vaccinated and how many vaccinations, trying to link all that in through public health data, um, we're just working through as a, as a system. Um, so we'll come back to you when we've got that information, but generally all age groups and a mixture of vaccinated and non-vaccinated is the day-to-day um, -day information I'm picking up. The, the reason I ask, sorry. Just to add to that briefly, Norman, um, on the regional call on Monday, when we look at the statistics for the East Midlands, mm -hmm. um, of those that were in ITU in the preceding week, 
25% of those had been vaccinated and 75% had not been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you some indication, you know, in respect of the East Midlands in that particular week. It's just that the main media keeps saying that, you know, there's a third wave on the NHS, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not reporting that there's a majority, as, as you've just 75%, who have not had the injections. I think if they reported that, it may encourage those who are not thinking about it to have a rethink and come in and have the injection because they can then see that they are at risk. If we just keep saying that the, the, the hospitals are filling up and not saying why, then we're not, we're not answering the question that the, the public are asking. It's just I, I think that information should be out there. Thank really, you, Angela. Really important, isn't it? Thank you for that. Um, can we no. go to Eddie next, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, Angie, it's just kind of a um, slightly sideways question. I, I was reading, I think, from the 1st of October, the NHS, NHS employees, and I think social care as well, have got to have, uh, have, have both vaccinations to go to a care home to do any medical treatment. Do we kind of think that might happen at the Royal, that might be some kind of stipulation that you've got to be doubly vaccinated to do certain areas? And do we see any kind of issues with, I think you reported 94% are double vaccinated, but that kind of, also that question of, is it going to happen, but also how do you ask staff about their status if it's not necessarily a, a kind of a public thing that's, that's released? Thanks, Eddie. And, and just to pick up um, Norman's point, as I speak, my WhatsApp message is going mad because all the chief execs are saying exactly as you said, Norman, in terms of that national public message, it's not being emphasised strongly enough at the moment. So um, people are on with it. Um, and it's a really good uh, question, Eddie, because um, uh, to be honest, I haven't heard that debate again for, for a while in terms of NHS um, staff. And every time um, we've had it with flu vaccination, even before COVID, and every time we get to the point of saying, yes, this should be mandated for all staff coming into contact, then for some reason we seem to pull back from it. Um, the, the debate at the moment is um, how can we do flu and COVID booster uh, at the same time in September? And I think that will push that question a little more from an NHS perspective because COVID has put a, a bit of a different emphasis on it uh, compared with flu, hasn't it? So, um, but you've reminded me to, to go back and just keep pushing on that, that element of it. And I think we are, I know there's still 6% of our staff that haven't had it. Um, and, and that uh, is at, at a point in time, remembering that, that we include junior doctors, for example, that rotate through us. Um, and we include one or two social workers who work under our roof. So actually keeping on top of that information um, is still a bit of an industry in itself. But generally, we do really well. So um, it's not always at the forefront of, of my brain to, to remember to pick up that question. But uh, uh, watch this space. I'm sure it will come back again very soon. Thank you. Um, let's go to Fiona, please. Hi, sorry, Angie. <clears throat> Uh, I, I kind of didn't quite catch. So, are some of the admissions uh, are are, you, are they what you'd call appropriate admissions? I guess, or is this a knock on from? Uh, I mean, GPs services are still not really fully running. You can't, you know, it's all very telemedicine, isn't it? Is it, are you saying actually the admissions are appropriate to coming through A and E, or are, is this a knock on from the sort of primary care sector? No, generally they are appropriate. Um, GPs are running at the same capacity as they were, uh, albeit it may look different and feel different. Um, and they are predominantly delivering the vaccination programme now. So I think we forget sometimes that um, they've done a phenomenal job out in um, primary care and making sure we're all vaccinated. And it is a bit that chicken and egg into, around um, do we prioritise that or, um, but we will always see patients in primary care where we need to. Um, and inevitably, there'll be some patients that get impatient and turn up at a &E. But we're doing a lot of work with um, DHU and 111 around how we can um, support patients at the front door so they're not sucked into the A&E department. Um, but inevitably, when we're overwhelmed at all angles, that doesn't always work as well as we, we want it to. Um, but generally, our audits are saying, yes, the patients, unfortunately, they're poorly and need to, need to be here. Um, 
Thank you. Luke, please. Yep, thank you. Um, hello, Angie. It was just really a question about what, if there's anything we could do support to support the staff from the improvement team. Are there any particular staff groups or areas that are under the most strain that we could support with in any possible way, really? Hi, Luke, and, and thanks for that offer. You do an amazing job, and um, uh, you haven't paid me to say that, but uh, you do do an amazing job supporting everyone anyway. So I, I suppose I'd just say please keep keep up that work. And that was why my report tried to pull out some of those amazing improvements, because I think it's fabulous that you, supporting all our staff, have managed to do the things they've do, done over the last 18 months when we've all been finding our way with this, running the vaccination programme and uh, looking after all our emergency patients. There's always more we can do. Um, you can support me, as I know some of you are tomorrow, in appointing a chief digital officer, because uh, I, I think that that digital way of supporting care for our patients, particularly out in the community, uh, we're going to need even more uh, going forwards, aren't we, if we ever get back to normal. But um, the demand definitely for the next year or two. Um, so any of those different ways of delivering care, uh, again, that I know you're on with, then uh, please continue. And from a government perspective, um, that the messages that you can give to our local population around using services wisely, I like to call it, rather than appropriately or inappropriately, um, bearing with us um, some very difficult complainants at the moment. And I understand people are frustrated, but it's it's not my staff's fault, I want to say sometimes. I never would say it as bluntly as that, but actually supporting people understanding the pressure we're under and, and how we can help them um, in the position that none of us want them to be in. Um, and then just the general message of supporting uh, all the staff, which again, it's a fabulous team that we have in Chesterfield and the community, isn't it? But keeping that going um, during the pressure at the moment would uh, would be gratefully received. Thanks, Luke, for the offer. Um, uh, Judith, please. Hi there, Angie. Um, sorry you're going through all of this again. You know, it, it must be so, so hard for you. And, and certainly as a governor, I'm sure we'd all want to support you as in any way we can. But the, just a slight query, you know me, I always ask these obtuse things. In the people who are being admitted, say to, um, say, well, you can't say which, but say renal and um, respiratory medical areas, are you noticing whether any of these admissions are actually people who are having to come back in having long COVID. So is this making an extra demand on the service? Hi Judith and, and thank you. And, and it's not just me, it's the whole team going through this and, um, and all of us together. Um, and I thought you were going to ask me a football conversation to keep your sense of humour, which I said to someone this morning, I've got to keep your sense of humour going. We'll talk later. Um, yes, there's long COVID impacts um, and we have got specific long COVID services being set up now. Um, and so particularly from the respiratory point of view, uh, that's had an impact. And, and just to link back into Luke's comment, um, then how we've set up the virtual wards to support those patients differently has just been brilliant because um, we would have been even more swamped with um, you know, patients under the roof or patients holding off because they don't want to come in when actually uh, the virtual ward approach, um, we started off from a COVID respiratory point of view, but looking how we can um, roll that out across all areas. And again, that's national, not just local, but the team locally have done a great job. Uh, but long COVID, again, the research, our teams have been involved with all sorts of research um, nationally as well. But I think um, that will continue to be important to understand the impacts of long COVID because it's still, uh, still being worked through. Thank you. Um, David, please. Well, I've got what I wanted to say, Helen, and it's really following the comments on isolation that uh, we've had made already. It appears, from what I can understand, and I could be wrong, that staff still have to walk guarantee for 10 days, even although they've had two COVID jabs. Is that correct? So if they've been in contact with someone who's COVID positive, um, then yes, they have to isolate. Um, and so if you've been pinned, as they fondly call it as well, then um, you have to isolate. 
there is a risk assessment process now being introduced as of this week for NHS staff that um, allows us to risk assess individuals who have been pinged, so not necessarily in direct contact, who have had vaccinations and are having daily lateral flow tests um, to assess whether we can bring them back to work. Um, but actually bringing them back to work, uh, the guidance suggests that you um, still need to isolate so you can drive to work, go home, but you mustn't go anywhere or speak to anyone or do anything. And when you're in work, you're supposed to sit on your own at your lunch break. Um, so asking our staff who've been through what they've been through um, to, to work in that way, some of them are keen to and want to and will support them with that. Um, but by the time you've risk assessed everybody and, and you can't put them in a, you know, a, a very clean area and put patients at risk, it's, it's not the panacea that I think um, people were hoping for on, uh, on Monday when the guidance was coming out. But we are working with all staff on an individual basis to, to work out how quickly we can get people back. OK. David, you indicated earlier that you had a question around um, implications of the current situation for recovery of um, planned care and, you know, elective surgery and the like. Um, it might be a good time for us to ask Angie to comment on that, if you'd like. Yeah, well, it's a question really about delayed operations, those that uh, involve cancer surgery, particularly, because really, staff seem to be absent with COVID and having, as we've just mentioned, isolation. So our cancer... I, I, what, what I was also going to add to, to that, and, and is not strictly within your remit, ambulance services are being hit. And I've said one or two comments people have made to me that ambulances are not as frequent and it's difficult because they are, I think, covered also by COVID regulations, which again will stop people getting, getting particular service from Ambulance. But I think this particularly covers West Midlands and Yorkshire. And I, I wonder really just in passing whether Yorkshire Ambulance Service serves us. I don't know. No, Yorkshire, Yorkshire does the occasional patient that comes over the border, but um, it's East Midlands Ambulance Service that serves us predominantly. Um, yesterday on the call, all ambulance services across the country were, were called into um, a summit because of, they were all at the most um, senior level of escalation. So although it may vary week on week and day on day, everywhere's hit this week. Um, yeah. And and that's with that demand I talked about earlier, as well as their uh, staff sickness. So you're right, David, it's, um, and clearly, you know, that they can't get to patients dialing 999 as quickly um, if they're tied up at hospitals, which is where when we've got delays and we're swamped, we sometimes are holding them longer than um, we want to. So it becomes a bit of a vicious circle then. So um, that's where we meet regularly as a whole system and the region to, to look at how we can support each other uh, in those circumstances. In terms of um, planned care, cancer surgery has always continued and does continue. Um, we prioritise our patients on the waiting list uh, by those that need a, a, an operation today, tomorrow, uh, and then those that need one within the next um, three weeks those that need one within the next month or two, and then those that um, uh, uh, can wait longer on a clinical assessment. So that's our, our doctors and nurses assessing that with the patients. And every patient, when they go over three months, we do a, a review as best we can, given the huge numbers we've got now, um, and working with GPs if patients are, are contacting them to say, you know, my condition is worsening. Um, but cancer we've kept on, on top of and is pretty similar to what it was in pre-COVID times in terms of patients waiting on the list. Um, for non-cancer procedures, yes, there are um, longer waits for patients at the moment. 
uh, Helen knows it's my favourite subject, so I can tell you there are 8,134 um, patients across Derbyshire waiting over a year now. Um, about 1,300 of those in, in Chesterfield, the rest are in UHDB. Um, that when we went into the pandemic, we had no patients waiting over a year. So just to give you a, an idea of the impact that that first wave and, and winter had on cancelling the elective. So the way that we survive in the NHS when um, we've got a huge emergency demand and staff off sick is to start with cancelling our planned care surgery first. At the moment, I um, haven't gone down that route in Chesterfield. Um, so we are still doing some surgery across the board, but because of staff sickness, we haven't got as many theatres open as we normally would have. We had hoped to open them in um, July, um, but unfortunately uh, we got to the first week of July and staff sickness meant um, we're still operating at about half of our normal theatre um, capacity. Uh, and then, of course, you, you have to put on top that the numbers of patients on lists is less now because of the PPE guidance and the uh, social distancing, etc. So it is having a delay to those patients who are on those planned care lists. But we have got a process in place for, for um, reviewing them so that we can um, move patients up the list if they're deteriorating. Thank it's you very awesome. much for that one. I wonder also if we could follow up what Norman was suggesting about letting people know about these things because the hospital may be unreasonably blamed for not attending to certain people, whereas, we're, as you say, we're doing your best. Thank you, David. We'll take that too. Um, just thinking aloud, Angie, um, with staff sickness absence running at just over 7%, which is not unusual or atypical, and arguably lower than normal, given that 3% of that total figure is attributable to COVID. And yet the impact and implication for our theatres is that they're running at 50%. And um, as you and I have discussed previously, it uh, points to the fact that there might be a number of a number of actions that we could take that would mitigate that. So we should probably just take an action to perhaps return to this issue with governors for an update. Um, after that work, I know you have in uh, progress is a bit uh, is a bit further um, a bit further down the um, implementation pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, really good. That'd be a very good idea. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, um, Derek. Please. Yeah, re regarding outpatients. Uh, a retired GP friend of mine, he phoned while we were in the earlier part of the meeting. And uh, amongst other things, he said that he'd just been to the dermatology outpatients department and from leaving home, which is Unston, it took him an hour to the hospital, being seen by the consultant, and he was back home in an hour. Is that sort of typical? How how is How are the outpatient departments performing then at the moment? Is there an impact from the general hospital situation with the COVID? Our outpatient performance is splendid, and I think Angie should take a bow on that front. Angie, give uh, give selected highlights. <laughs> the team can take a bow. I'll do it for them. Um, so uh, when we are measuring our performance, Derek, we're asked nationally to look at um, the, the numbers of patients that we're seeing this year compared to 1920 as your baseline pre-COVID. Um, and for our patients, we've been at 120 percent. I think this week we're at 109 percent. Um, occasionally we dip down to 90. But if you think about um, when you physically come into our patients at the moment, it is slower. I'm really pleased and I'll give my favourite dermatology example in a minute. Um, but I'm really pleased that your, your colleague was in and out in a reasonable time. Um, because we, again, with the social distancing and the PPE, et cetera, it does slow you down in, in clinics, especially where you are performing procedures. So to be actually doing even more than we were pre-pandemic, I think, is a, a credit to the staff. Um, some of that is because we've used um, technology. So uh, I've learned what a dermatoscope is, um, which actually uh, is a posh camera uh, that um, uh, GPs can take a photo of your skin lesion um, but the quality of image that we can send in now, and, and thanks to our IT team, the, the dermatologist in the hospital 
can look at that uh, and say, yes, actually do X, Y and Z or no, I, ne I need to see this patient, send them in. Whereas previously the, the GP would have just done a, a referral and we would have seen every patient. So again, just an example of, of how we're working differently that has meant we can be much more efficient in our outpatient areas. Yeah, so it's sort of smarter working, really, I suppose, isn't it? Which has perhaps been uh, inspired, perhaps, by the COVID situation, and uh, it's part of the way forward, no doubt. And it is. It's great how um, uh, uh, one of my consultant colleagues and I joke that um, if you'd ask consultants, uh, and I'm not picking on doctors, but he is one, um, but if you'd asked them to do this a couple of years ago, they came up with all the reasons why we couldn't do it. Um, whereas now they think it's great and um, you know where it's appropriate for the for the patient because it's not for every patient, um, but they're real advocates uh, of it, which is fabulous. Right, thank you. Ed Norman, please. Andrew, you mentioned about patients. You know the, the amount of people now waiting over a year. The government talks about a third, uh, maybe a fourth wave now, during the winter or early next year. I think COVID could be with us for at least 100 years, a century, before this is eradicated, if at all. Uh, what's the government thinking on NHS and planning now? Because will, will a year's waiting list become the norm uh, going forward with staff shortages, COVID, and maybe something else that comes into the mix we don't know in the future? But it, it must be very difficult to plan staff-wise theatres, operations, etc. when all of a sudden all that comes to a halt again because of another wave. So we need, I think we need to have a look at the jigsaw and, and, and put it back in the box and bring it out again and, 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 and look at a different way of putting it together because this is not going to work, just keep limping along, is it? We need something that, uh, a, a positive structure that deals with hospitals, um, primary care, etc to make sure that the public are aware that this could go on for a long time and you will not now see your GP and be in hospital within six weeks, it may be six months or 12. And I think that that's a positive message that we need to get out, not, not necessarily from the hospital, but from the government, rather than, excuse the pun, keep putting the plaster over it, hoping it gets better. So I think there's, there's a lot more deep thinking needs to be done than, than the, the massive, wonderful job that you're doing and your staff are doing at the moment. Um, Thank you. I think we'd all be in favour of clear communications, Norman, absolutely. I know that mm -hmm. um, Angie, working with her colleagues in the system, is trying valiantly to make sure that that's not the message, because whilst it might be, it might be good to be proactive in communications, it's far from a positive message, isn't it? Um, so we're very much yeah. hoping that by thinking of new ways of working and by working together, um, you know, that we will be able to um, make sure that we find ourselves not in that position. Um, but, mm. you know, that doesn't attract at all from your, your point about trying to be on the front foot in terms of communications. Um, Margaret, please. Uh, just reiterate, going, well, I was going to say more or less what you've just said is that um, a, lot of, a lot of this is going to be down to the the system, I think, is an active part of the system, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so that we get the right people to the right services to try and reduce some of those waiting lists without um, them all having to come into the hospital. So I think we know we're going to try and have some training about the ICS and, and what that means, but I think a lot of what this means is, uh, as, as we've already descri described, working smarter so that we actually can get through some of these waiting lists in a smarter way using different, you know, like be it technology or whatever. And I think that's the message that we need to be perhaps getting across to people as well, is that you won't necessarily come in to see a consultant in the hospital and then go on to there. There may be different pathways that we can actually work smarter to get some of these waiting lists down. I just wanted to sort of make that comment, watch this, watch this space a bit and hope that the system working really does deliver what we hope it will do. Absolutely. Well said, Margaret. Uh, Pervez, please. <clears throat> this item is going to be on the agenda very soon, but uh, I'm very pleased to see that 
projects in your annual development plan for year 2020 and 21. You have put an uh, elect non-elective surgery and waiting time as a first priority, which is very reassuring. Thank you, Pervez. Um, uh, and um, I, I would agree with your sentiments entirely. And as you say, we'll come to have a substantive discussion on that. Actually, probably now, I think we've um, I think we've exhausted the questions on your report, Angie. I always think a measure of a good report is how many questions it, it, it provokes. So um, it certainly passed that test. Thank you very much. Um, we've got double Angie, which is nothing like double maths. Um, it's much better altogether. And uh, we're going to go straight on to um, item five, which is together as one strategy. I have to say, um, by way of opening on this, that it has been an act of great leadership on behalf of our executive colleagues um, to not get embroiled only in the here and now, consuming and all as that has been, and to be able to think sufficiently broadly and in the round to chart a course forward for us over the next five years, which is going to be so important in terms of serving our community and best population health outcomes, um, you know, on the back of what it is we as a society have been through. So I think it's, you know, before you before you even say anything, Angie, um, huge credit uh, for us being in a position to consider this item today. So thank you. So floor is yours. Thank you. And my apologies, Pervez, I couldn't hear your question. So Helen will help me if I don't answer it or cover it as we talk through. Um, and I'm not going to uh, talk at length uh, about this because I think um, for me, it illustrates why we need to do um, what we've done when we talk about the here and now and, and the things that we've just been discussing about the real opportunities that system working gives us not only in the future, but there's real examples across a number of specialties and corporate areas where we are working differently and better together. Um, and actually, when we started out on the journey of refreshing our strategy, I remember it very clearly because um, Helen introduced me to someone and said, oh, Angie's been here about six weeks now and I'd only actually been here two. Um, but she assured me it was in the nicest possible way that it felt like I'd been here longer. Um, so that it was a uh, almost two years ago that we started out thinking about what does our future for the next five years need to look like um, and it is such a different world now in terms of those conversations not only with our partners and how we work differently um, but through a pandemic with the the technology as we've just talked about again and the way that we work um, and fundamental for me um, is I've, I've welcomed our new junior doctors uh, this morning uh, and talk them through the, the strategy and what it means um, and what our vision, mission and values are. Um, and the way that we deliver care, uh, I think is summed up really well in those care values and our five strategic objectives. So thank you to all of you and to all um, colleagues who helped us develop and shape those. We had a really good response to the engagement in it. Um, and I think we've done a, a, a good job of keeping what was already good and we wanted to build on and refreshing some of those with what we've learned um, over the past few years about the way that we want to go forward. Um, and I'll say no more, Helen, apart from uh, all the examples we've just talked about and that challenge that you've just um, described, hopefully will bring this to life. And I'm, I'm very adamant that this isn't a document that sits on a shelf, but is very real for all of us. And, and we all uh, contribute to making it um, come alive and make a difference for the Derbyshire population. Thanks, Angie. And perhaps to frame any comments or questions, but obviously not to curtail them from governors. Um, this is a really important document now for governors to take and um, in the context of it to reflect on the um, success criteria that governors set um, each year or at least refresh each year. Uh, because that's your way of saying to non-executive directors, we're going to want to talk to you about these things a lot and we're going to know what you're doing and how you're doing it and how you're progressing. Um, but of course, we use the kind of um, the, the framework of the strategy to, um, you know, to open that discussion. And now having our revised strategy, obviously the time is right for us to um, consider what refreshing we want to do to the governor's success criteria document so Margaret has a cunning plan um, to take that through the next nominations committee so we don't have to start the blank sheet of paper 
but after a discussion at nominations, then there will be a kind of draft put to um, a future meeting of the full uh, Council of Governors to consider uh, what changes you'd like to make, if any, in the light of this, uh, this revised strategy. So um, that's important. So I'm going to go to Judith and then Pervez in that order, please. Uh, um, excuse me, Angie, if um, I'm talking completely out of turn here, um, I think it's a brilliant, I've only just had access to it, it, I didn't get any of the papers. It's really a question maybe as much as anything for Lee, because I think your outcomes, I'm sort of looking at page three, your outcomes are, are just what I'd want to see, but am I right in thinking that that might require a change of approach in terms of financial remuneration so that there's not an immediate assumption of punitive response from how should I be tactful and say the powers that be if you miss by just a bit or something because I think we can always re all remember to pre-COVID it was much more an emphasis to me as a governor um, on what you haven't done and therefore you won't get this is wonderful, but he's only going to succeed if that's slightly changed. And I don't know if you've picked up anything that the voice has changed. There's been huge changes in the financial regime and more to come. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to just maybe give us a quick teach in on that, Angie or Lee. Yeah, I'd, I'd just um, I'll let Lee do the, um, the, the detail. Um, but for me, that's back to the, the ICS and the opportunities that the financial framework that will support that gives us to deliver care in a different way. Um, but Lee, you do a good summary of that. I, I think, Judith, everybody recognises the sort of short term finance regime that hung around for about five years with this kind of pass fail number for trusts, which meant that if you hit a bottom line INE number, you got a bung. And if you didn't, is no longer fit for purpose. So I can't imagine we're going to go back to that. The, the truth is we're still sort of waiting for the financial settlement for the second half of the year, and we now understand it will look more like the COVID settlement, but perhaps it will have a bit more of an efficiency requirement embedded in it. I, I think in the ICS space in Derbyshire particularly, we're having a conversation about really understanding the costs of services and not getting into this odd wooden dollars conversation between commissioning and provision because it just won't exist in the same way. So we really need to major on what's the value we're getting for our clinical services and how do we offer that differently? And I think that's an enormous opportunity. So as opposed to being remunerated for episodic care, we can have a real conversation about how does the hospital reach out? How do we do more advice and guidance? How do we support primary care in a different way? I, I think it's a really big opportunity. The, the problem with all of that episodic care reimbursement where we were remunerated for an outpatient consultation or a finished consultant episode for an inpatient in hospital isn't helpful if you're trying to do shared and integrated care. So I think it, it is bound to change and change for the better. That's not to say there isn't a large looming financial challenge. But having said that, I think if we've got a more elegant finance regime that thinks more about cost of services and clinical value and changing and integrating how we deliver care, there won't be any of the odd perverse incentives we had previously where I go, oh, crikey, if we keep patients out of hospital, which is obviously the right thing to do, I can't afford to pay the staff. We still not may, might not be able to pay the staff, but it will be for different and more elegant reasons, I would hope. So um, more to follow, certainly. Thank you very much. I'd like to clarify for the camera and the recording that our finance director was being flippant about our ability to pay our staff and we've just had a clean bill of health from our external auditors <laughs> and are sufficiently liquid for the uh, coming period. Um, um, Pervez, please. Uh, in our annual development plan for 2020 and 2021, it is stated that we will aim to improve our ward and achieve bronze status for 90% of our wards and silver status for the remaining 10% of our wards. Well, first of all, I, like many other people in the room, would like to know how do we define these categories, bronze, silver, and gold? And my second question is, are we not little less ambitious 
and are reserving only 10% of our votes to go to silver status, why not 90% of our votes being silver? Did you catch that, Angie? I think that was about the accreditation and how we define silver, gold, um, and Krishna's about to join us, so I'd quite like her to take the um, credit for all the work that she's put into that programme, if that's all right, and um, uh, she'll talk us through it, Pervez, because it, it actually links in a little bit to um, patient experience as well, so is that all right? Of course. Is she on the call? Can you see Angie or not uh, yet? Nick's going to advise me at what point she's going to text her, because we're nearly there, Nick, aren't we? So if you can click on send on the text, Krishna will magically appear shortly. I am doing it now. Thanks, Nick. We'll come back to that shortly, Pervez, um, when Krishna joins us. Um, can I check, are there any more um, questions or comments or thoughts around the strategy at the moment? Uh, Eddie. Just just a very quick one to start to say, I think it's, it's a very readable and very kind of, you know, attractive topic. It's quite a, 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 an excellent piece. I think sometimes strategies can be very difficult to get into but it's it's you know it, it is a reasonable and you know both in context and the layout it's 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 a good document i like to thank you and um, that's um as, as as one of the as one of the key audience for us that's a particularly gratifying feedback to get so thank you eddie uh, margaret i just wanted to check with you that, that I, I hope my cunning plan will be better than baldrick's <laughs> cunning plans but um uh, are, are the governors generally happy for us to to do that to use that process to use this document as the basis for a discussion about our measures measures of success, which will have a have a good go at at nominations and then bring it forward for uh, the council to approve? Are people happy with that process? I've seen a few nodding heads and a thumbs up from John. More thumbs up. Yeah. They say in, in the past we have had like a workshop sort of session with everybody in a room together to hammer these things out, but circumstances just aren't that you know, we're not at that position at the moment. So this feels like the best of the um you know, the best that we can do at the moment. So if everybody's happy we'll uh, we'll uh, take it forward that way. Thanks. A very pragmatic next step, I think, Margaret. So thank you for that. Uh, very good. Well, um, thank you again, Angie, and um, our congratulations to uh, you and the team. And of course, um, Sarah Turner Saint, who has now left us, had uh, has left her fingerprints um, all over this strategy um, in terms of the approach to engagement uh, with the strategy by uh, colleagues and by stakeholders, and indeed in the clarity of the communication. So. Um, I hope that us acknowledging her now will be a cause for her to have hot ears and we can uh, convey those thanks to her um, in due course. So that brings us on, if we may, now to the next um, item on the agenda. Um, so I just want to check if Krishna has joined us yet. Just so, uh, Governor, yes. go sorry. I have Helen. Ah, welcome, Krishna. Sure. Just so governors are clear, um, our executive colleagues are not dipping in and out because they have nothing better to do. Um, I, I, on your behalf, excused them, so to speak, um, suggesting that they only join us for their items, not least of all because of the pressures across the trust that Angie has described to you in our update. Um, so I know it's bought um, exec colleagues a, a little bit of extra time in their afternoon. Uh, but we feel even more privileged that you've made the time to join us. So you're very welcome, Krishna. Thank you. Before you talk to us about the real time patient feedback work you're doing, um, we had a question from um, Pervez um, in the context of our uh, strategy document that Angie suggested you might like to speak to Krishna when you join us. And if I can paraphrase the uh, question, it was about ward accreditation. And if you could say a little bit about the criteria and the categories of bronze, silver and gold and what you need to do to get them. But also a very good challenge from Pervez that are we perhaps being a little bit lacking in ambition, wanting 90 percent to be bronze, the other 10 percent to be silver. And, um, you know, what are the opportunities for being a bit more ambitious or pacey around all of that? So if you wouldn't mind doing that just before uh, we open on the uh, real time patient feedback, please. Yes, no problem at all, Helen. Thank you. Um, so if I, if I just answer the question then about ward accreditation programme. 
So a number of, um, it's an ambition from the Chief Nursing Officer of England, Ruth May, that all um, trusts have some form of accreditation process. What we've what we've actually got here at Chesterfield is quite a tough, quite a tough sort of robust uh, methodology. And we know that because we're trying to engage with um, a company to try and help us from a digital point of view, to make it far easier for us to input the data, translate what that means, be able to get a score, get some outcome and support the teams. Because this is about a quality and improvement methodology. So the feedback we've had is that oh, it's quite, it's going to be quite tough. So I'm with you about in, improvements on that ambition. And currently we've now got two wards that are silver, which is, and we've got a number that are bronze, very high bronze and very near to coming up to silver. But we do, what we don't want to do is, so wards can progress up, but they can also progress down. So if we go back and do our assessments after a number of months, and we find that the standards that we're wanting aren't quite up to what we were expecting, then the scoring tool can mark wards down as well as up, which is you know needs to be responsive to to what we're seeing. The assessment itself is is done on a day, but it's not it doesn't just look at what ha is happening on that day. So it takes into account patient feedback, all sorts of ward indicators, infection control audits of previous months, looks at trends and themes and looks at documentation that will be from that patient might have been an inpatient for months or weeks, but it will go back and, and look at that documentation. So it's it, whilst it's done on a day by the professionals, so we've always got consistency. So the methodology is really sound. We've got leads such as our safeguarding lead, infection control and prevention sort of lead in there, falls lead tissue viability, they're the ones that go in and do their assessments for their criteria. So we know we've got a consistency. So we're really proud of, of actually the, the accreditation itself, the, the methodology. Yes, I'm with you. I want to strive. I want all, I don't just want our wards silver. I want our wards gold. That's what we want. That's what our patients serve. So that's where we are. But you can't really get straight from white to gold. You've got to have that support for the ward teams. And what we've what we've found is that during COVID, we've had new leaders on the wards and we need to put some development. So we're starting that development with infection prevention control. We've got regional leads to come and help support us to do some walkbacks, um, to put that critical friend view in to support ward leaders. We've got a whole package that we're going to support our ward leaders that will help them to translate what we need them to do translate that with their team so that the standards that we've got are high across all of our wards. So we've, we're, we're, our benchmark is really high, and we know that. We want to strive to, to, to more and we can update you as we as we go along and perhaps, you know, we could perhaps do a little bit more. Helen, would that be helpful for the Council of Governors next? Well, next I was just, yeah, I was just listening to you speak, Chris, and I was thinking, you know, this is gold dust at any time, but particularly now when we've no uh, Governor Ward visits. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a great window on, you know, issues and um, ambitions for wards and different parts of the trust. So I think that's a really welcome offer. Thank you, Krishna. Jane. Um, I just put something in the chat box to say that I've personally been out on one of these visits and it really is very tough. Um, but they are the standards that we want and they're the standards that we expect. And it, and it will be incremental progress. And we have been delayed by COVID, but our ambition is not that everybody is silver. Our ambition is that everybody is gold, but our ambition is that it is sustained gold. So the progress we made, we can continue, continue, continue to deliver. So I, I think it's a fabulous programme. I, I don't think we should apologise for it being tough. I think what we should do is if we think it's tough is we should look at the support we're giving to the staff to achieve. That's super. That's been a great question, Pervase. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, very rich discussion. Now, um, poor old Krishna is a victim of her success, her own success here, because when she brought the patient experience report to the board, um, she went a little bit off piste and described with great um, enthusiasm 
um, her ambitions around real-time patient feedback and digitally enabled real-time patient feedback. So I said to Nicola, we have to get at least a flavour of that to our governor colleagues. Um, so that's what Krishna is going to do for us next, please. So I'm just going to sort of talk through where we are and what our ambition is. So the actual the ambition is is to get real time patient feedback, and we've we've managed to um, engage with a company that we couldn't allow us to do that. The work we've worked up, we're just going to present at HLT a business case to support us to implement it. It's called Care Opinion. But what we're doing along that is that. To get real-time patient feedback, you need local resolution. So you need, if patients are raising concerns, if families are raising concerns there and then, they need a timely response by the clinician, the person nearest to wherever their, their, um, the issue or complaint or concern is, to be able to have that dialogue and to have it more timely, um, more present, an interaction, which is far better than raising a concern through PALS, far better than the time it will take to do a formal complaint. And we're not saying that this will um, prevent us having any formal complaints, but what it should do is to allow patients to have access and to be able to raise concerns and know that they will get a response. So for me, when we've looked at our current complaints process and our PALS, and we've now got a new um, lead in for um, our quality and governance lead, Anne Rolf, who's now day three, bless her. Um, she's actually used to this company um, and this digital um, technology at the hospital where she worked. Um, but she also supports what we're doing here at Chesterfield, and that's supporting our leaders to be able to um, articulate and be able to do local resolution. And that's quite an art form. So if somebody raises a question, we should be able to um, have our ward leaders instantly put that, be in touch and put that communication. But what it does mean is that we've, we've had to do and provide some training and support, which we started in July, it's going through August and into September. And that's to support not just local resolution, so it's to, to try and support um, visitors and carers and patients raising issues on the wards and departments. It's also to raise and, and to be able to support um, a more robust, less defensive, more open and um, transparent sort of conversation and response back to people so that we can demonstrate that we've listened and we're not defensive and that we have thought about what would really make a difference so that whatever has happened and whatever um, the patient has, has felt that we don't sort of keep having that same theme going forward and we can be able to monitor that through quality assurance committee with the themes and trends that we get so the work that we've been doing alongside putting the business case forward is the training and education to support our leaders to be able to uh, deal with local resolution to try and prevent things escalating because we've all been in a situation where we we've, we've had to complain or wanted to complain about something Imagine, imagine in a, you know, going to complain and then four months later you receive a response to that. That is extremely frustrating. That's not really where we want to be. So wherever we can, we want to encourage our ward leaders to be able to and, and um, trust leaders to be able to do that timely response. Does that does that help where we are at the moment? Oh, super. Thank you very much, Krishna. I also think that this shifts the dial a bit from a complaint to a dialogue. Yes. Because often when people are telling you about a concern, you know, the last thing they want to do is complain, but they are trying to open up a channel of communication where issues can get resolved. And when you see this work well in the private sector and in customer settings, you know, where people are in dialogue with her. My favourite example is the stagecoach one. You know, if you sit on a stagecoach bus and you email, um, you know, the head office to say, I'm really fed up on this bus because I'm baking because your air con has gone off. You know, when it works well, stagecoach, get that message to the bus driver who pulls in at the next bit and walks down to seat 20A and says, I gather you're a bit hot and bothered. I can't fix the air con, but I happen to have a bottle of water. Will that help how you're feeling? Um, you know, it's it's really taking the whole issue up front. 
And having been in organisations that have done this successfully, the other thing it does is I think it causes a cultural revolution. Uh, because we have staff who love their patients. And, um, you know, it's sometimes hard for them to call out what it is they really need in order to be able to serve their patient. And I don't mean to be flippant um, in giving these sort of examples. But, you know, if on going into a ward, the uh, staff team can see that somebody is sitting in a bed going, I've been 20 minutes waiting on a bedpan. And um, it will it will absolutely um, if if Chesterfield is anything like anywhere else, empower staff to put requirements on us as leaders of the trust and on the leaders who are working more closely with them to think about what it is we need to do differently in order to serve patients better. This is much easier to call for change if you're calling for change with the immediacy of responding to your patient's needs. And it just it changes that whole dialogue and helps us get that culture about, you know, patients front and centre of everything we do. So as you can probably tell, um, I'm really quite excited about uh, the prospect of this rolling out uh, to places near us soon. Uh, Jane. Um, so I want to share something with you. I've been having a dialogue with Judith this morning, a lovely dialogue. Um, it happened to be about royal primary care, but it really doesn't matter. And I shared something with Judith, um, which somebody very wisely taught to me when I was a new director of nursing, which was to say that every patient's experience is their experience. It may not be everybody's experience, but it is still their experience and it is therefore very valued and valuable to us in terms of learning. So I, I just think that this system fits so beautifully with that, doesn't it? And, and I absolutely agree, Helen, this is about dialogue. So I have never forgotten that being told to me. So when people talk about, you know, things like FFT and we've got 27 things about communication, but it doesn't really tell us anything. But actually, when we listen to individuals, we learn so much more. Completely, completely. And without going on it too much, but a, another thing I think it enables and empowers is it gets colleagues talking together. Um, so, you know, if there's been a really good experience on a ward, so say there's been a particularly um, um, a, a patient who's had very particular needs um, and, you know, one member of staff or one ward vis-a-vis -vis another finds it hard to meet those, when they find that there's really positive feedback or a positive dialogue going on, they ask each other about what has it taken to turn that from a negative into a positive dialogue because we'd like to do the same where we are. So that sense of being a learning organisation in real time, but not a kind of top down thing, a peer to peer thing is, again, a really important cultural feature mm. of um, of this initiative. So well done, Krishna. Um, and um, any help or support you need, um, you know, be sure to ask. Thank you. Um, so if you do need to go elsewhere, please feel free. And if not, of course, um, it would be good to have you with us. Um, and I just want to check a, a quick show of hands. Would anybody like a short comfort break before we go to the vexed matter of smoking? Or um, I see at least one. Yes. Well, let's have a short comfort break. It's just before 10 to. Would everybody mind coming back for 5 to, please? So 14.55. See you soon.
I just had a bit of a rumpus at my house. A grass snake's just got in. Oh, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> So my, my apologies, if you heard a bit of a rumpus while I was speaking earlier, it was because I've got painters and people here and they were all trying to catch it. Did it just slide in its own accord? It did indeed. It is now safely back in a box and gone to the back field, apparently. I, did, I really didn't know what was happening, so I, I do apologise. Are you, are you in your holiday home in Kenya? <laughs> if only, Helen, if only. Obviously, it was a bit hot in small if the grass snakes to be outdoors. <laughs> it might have been attracted by the meeting. Yeah. Well, it would have had to come upstairs for that, John, because I've gone to the <laughs> coolest room in the house. <laughs> but usually our cats that bring us something like a, a bring a frog or a, yeah, occasionally a bird. <laughs> we, we did have a bird in the um, kitchen a few weeks ago, fully alive. Well, this is they hadn't harmed it. This is yeah, just brought, just brought it into alive. <laughs> well, this this has caused some consternation amongst three grown men. Clearly, <laughs> oh, did, did nobody want to pick it up? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. I don't probably wonder was there a practical nurse in the house. <laughs> Um, let's kick off again. Um, so thank you for coming back promptly. Really helpful. Can I just check, Pervez, do you have a have your hand up to ask a question or you're on mute? Yes, please. Very simple question. Shall I go? Yes, please. Well, my question is, uh, when we talk about the ward leaders, does it mean nursing leaders are medical leaders and professional allied to medicine leaders as well? Because often in ward, you have all these three teams looking after the same patient. I'm, I'm assuming that's a rhetorical question, uh, but I think it's a point very well made, Pervez, because of course leadership has to extend across all those three parties to looking after a patient. Um, I don't know whether, Jane, you can comment on the extent to which we get a in good involvement of all of those parties in the accreditation process. 
Um, I can't I can't comment from the one that from the one I did the day that I did it, um, Perez. Um, it was mainly the nursing staff that were involved at that stage. But I would say that the information is collect. There's a lot of information that's collected and reviewed and that comes from all parties. And clearly we do need to recognise that it, it is multidisciplinary. So I will actually take that question back to Krishna for you, Thank you. for a bit more clarity, because I think it's there have been some areas of the trust where actually when we've been thinking about multidisciplinary team working, that it's been really critical, really, really critical in terms of quality improvement that we've seen recently. So, for example, in stroke. So I think you make a very good point and I will double check that. Thank you. Thank you. That's another very good question. Thank you. Um, so we'll go on, if we may, now, please, to item eight, which is the smoke free site update. And there's been a discussion both at um, HLT and subsequently at board um, with a proposed way forward. Um, I think a way has been settled on in terms of um, visitors and staff. Uh, no, sorry, visitors and patients, I should say. And I know colleagues are still doing some thinking about staff, but we've asked Hal to give you an update today because I'm sure this will be um, a matter on which you will have uh, views and thoughts. Um, so, Hal, the floor is yours. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully you can all hear me clearly and, and um, see, see me on, on your screen. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's worth um, going backwards a little bit and remembering that smoking is something that has been discussed previously extensively at, at board and at governors. Um, and the reason often that we've had um, lots of those discussions is because whilst as a organisation we are all absolutely committed to the concept of um, stopping smoking and the health benefits related to that, we have struggled for a long time with implementing that in practice um, alongside um, many other organisations um, across the country. Um, so um, the NHS has over the last 10 years or so brought in various plans with aspirations to be completely smoke free first by 2015 then by 2020 and it slipped again and, and that um, slippage I think reflects the difficulty that lots of organisations have, have had. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving that context and starting by saying that really that this proposal we, we would see as a least worst option. This isn't in lots of ways something um, that we think is a, a really um, good thing. It's something that we're recognising that we've struggled for a long time and that this is a pragmatic approach to um, minimise um, the downsides of smoking, if that makes sense. Um, I, I'm hoping that you've all had a chance to look at the paper and read um, this summary, but there's a couple of things that I would like to to draw out again, partly for um, context. Um, one is that um, the this eventual paper and proposal is on the back of a lot of engagement from um, different people. So we we um, prior to the COVID pandemic, we held a um, uh, listening to action big conversation where staff and um, patients and um, indeed governors were invited to contribute to, to that. And whilst there was a universal feeling that um, smoking wasn't a good thing and we would all prefer the site to be completely smoke free, there was also a widespread recognition that what we were doing at the present time wasn't working. Um, there was concerns raised particularly um, by staff regarding um, the potential dangers of passive smoking, there's certain areas that people will know um, smokers congregate. So, for example, outside what we call the, the fishbowl, which is the back courtyard entrance, also outside the front entrance, where um, there's often smokers there. And, and in some cases, there's offices nearby where um, those offices smell of smoke the, the whole time. So there's a there's a risk to our staff and um, because of passive smoking. A lot, in a related way, obviously the appearance of the hospital when people have come 
you know, if you're coming to an outpatient appointment, whatever, in this congregations of smokers outside the main entrance, that's a very sort of an attractive appearance for the hospital, which is, after all, trying to promote health. And, and that those points were um, brought brought out by both patients, visitors, and, and indeed by governors in the past. So um, there was a widespread feeling at that that consultation, if you'd like, that we needed to do something about it because it, there was no point in just carrying on. There was lots of discussion about whether we could spend time um, more strictly enforcing our smoke-free policy. And there was talk about whether we employed um, no smoking wardens and um, you know whether that would make a difference and security could more strictly um, enforce this. But I think we need to acknowledge that at the present time, this is legally unenforceable. So the law can, can be used to prevent people smoking within a building, but there is no law against smoking outside in a public space. And until um, there's national legislation about that, if we had, for example, smoking wardens who were telling people off about smoking outside the front entrance, there isn't actually anything they can do about it if the smoker says, well, tough, I'm going to carry on staying here. The, the, the only way of legally um, taking redress would be about littering. So if the person dropped their cigarette afterwards, then you can you can find people for littering. But in practical terms, that isn't something that, that um, would, would work. And we did speak to um, Derbyshire County Council regarding you know, their, their approach in these situations. And, and it is clear that there isn't a legal way of enforcing this. Um, the, the final thing to uh, mention about that is that, that we have done a lot to try to encourage um, staff and um, uh, at all levels in the hospital to, to speak to smokers. And that's something that some people feel able to do. Some people feel quite intimidated by it. And there were lots of stories of where staff have challenged smokers, where they've been um, verbally abused and felt quite threatened and intimidated by it. So that's the context. And for that reason, um, the proposal in the end from that, that um, sort of working group was that what we should try to do was to um, contain the smoking um, issue in spaces that were away from um, entrances where there was a, both um, an aesthetic um, concern, but also where there was potentially risk to our staff and visitors regarding passive smoking. And that's where the proposal for smoking centres, um, uh, smoking shelters comes from. And the proposal would be that there were three shelters um, a little distance away from the three main entrances to the hospital. Um, we would propose doing this as a trial. Um, we've talked about doing this for a six month period. And if it really doesn't work and people are still smoking outside the front entrance, then we would acknowledge that it didn't work and we would look to a, a different approach. Um, but we think that there isn't we think it's not sensible to just carry on doing what we're doing because it, it really isn't isn't working. Um, there is a final sort of question a little bit, and, and I'd be interested in governor's um, views about this, about how hardline we should be being with staff around this. Obviously, it is possible to have within our staff um, uh, workforce policies um, rules about them not smoking and there is, our intention would be that these smoking shelters should not be used by staff members, that this would only be for um, visitors or for, or in certain cases, inpatients in, in the hospital. But, but the absolute intention would be that this wasn't for um, staff members. But there is a bit of a surrounding question about when if staff members are smoking on site, how how kind of strictly we approach that and that's a bit of a, a question open to the um, open to debate I suppose. So I think that's the the context we're, we're obviously bringing it to governors as, as Helen says it's already been discussed and agreed at both HLT and board where in both cases it was recognized that this isn't a perfect solution but it's as I say the sort of least worst option in our, our case but I know governors have obviously had a long-standing interest in this particular topic and therefore for and transparency and, and um, open discussion, we're, we're bringing it back to governors now. So I'll pause there and I'm, I'm very happy to take any any questions. That was uh, brilliantly explained. Uh, thank you, Hal, for setting the scene as well as you have. 
I'd like to just add very briefly uh, some personal thoughts around the staff issue and uh, just before we open it to governors. Um, if we're putting this arrangement in place on a pilot basis for visitors and for patients, um, I personally feel it's quite heavy handed for us to rely on our um, employment contract to prevent staff having access to the same or a similar facility. And it's, you know, smoking is not illegal. It's not a very sensible thing to do, but we employ highly educated, highly trained people who are well capable of making that risk assessment for themselves. We don't risk assess for our colleagues whether or not they should eat sugar or cake or fizzy drinks or any of those things. Um, you know, and I wouldn't like us to be putting an arrangement in place for staff and for, uh, uh, sorry, for patients and for visitors uh, with that level of, in my view, discrimination against staff. But I appreciate, um, you know, that there might be a whole range of views on this, which is why it would be so helpful um, to understand where it is uh, governors sit on, on, on the issue in the round. Um, so if I can come to Lynn first, please. Thank you, Helen. Um, well, as you know, Helen, I've been involved in the um, various committees and working parties over the years. Um, I don't really feel that we've moved much further forward than we were before. Um, I've never had a, an issue with asking people to not smoke in the entrance. Um, yeah, sometimes, you know, people aren't very uh, happy about you mentioning things, but um, you know, I've never felt threatened or anything like that. Um, but I do um, follow the, um, face, the, the hospital Facebook page and um, that there is often, uh, there are often comments on the Facebook page about smoking from, from staff. And just uh, on one day um, this last week, um, cool. there were quite a lot of comments um, I'd just like to read you one or two, if that's OK. So staff were saying it smells disgusting and it looks disgusting. We have to push patients through it. This is the entrance at the back. Um, the lift smells as well as the corridors. And why do we have to put up with it? Um, somebody else said we, we won an award for the non-smoking policy and I don't think we deserve it. Um, they proud to be smoke free is a joke. Um, walking through after a hectic night shift, there were four patients smoking. It looked like a pub garden. I had to squeeze through. It's very disheartening. And then the lady who brings the therapy dogs, Bev Dayton, she put a post on to say, we find it very difficult to get through that area. The smokers always want to stroke the dogs, but we have to tell them they can't as we don't want them to smell of smoke on the wards. And I have to hold my breath to get through it. Um, there are lots and lots of different comments. Um, and I think it's really important that we take this as seriously as we can, because I think just paying lip service to it uh, isn't going to work because staff are just going to think that we don't care about how they feel. Um, I mean, we talked a lot in previous working groups about putting in smoking shelters. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with it, but I do wonder when these smoking shelters are going to cost us, what, £7,500 each, how patient, other patients and the public will feel about us spending the best part of £22,000 on three smoking shelters um, when we could probably use that money more wisely. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. You, you bring out very uh, well the complexity of these decisions. Uh, but as you say, it's important we're seen to do something and having had the big conversation with staff, hopefully it'll be an informed uh, response. But thank you for that. Eddie, please. Thank you. I, 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 I think there's this, unfortunately, no easy answer to this. And I know, you know, um, being on site for the last kind of 15 years that you can walk around site at any time and see staff smoking anyway. So, you know, there are areas where you go to and you can guarantee almost any time of the day there will be a member of staff sitting there smoking. So I think it, it is a difficult debate about if you have shelters, will they be used? And if, even if you say staff can't use them, you then how do you police the areas which they, they currently use anyway? So I think it, it's going to be 
what you know what a, a, any solution is going to be very difficult and very you know difficult to police in any kind of thing i think on the on on, on the legal side i think partly it's the you know social side of, of of smoking i think you know if if it was drinking on site alcohol you know even though again you could argue that's not legal in in in, in certain areas that you can drink it in public so i think it's it's you know it's, it's a very difficult situation but you know for, for a person who's, whose um office is actually on the elizabeth kind of courtyard in summer you just can't have your window open because it's just people just sit there and it's, you know it, it is that debate that when you do challenge you know quite often they've said they've been helped down by a member of staff to smoke so you know is, is that where do you draw the line and is it a health issue is it a social issue or is it a, a, a legal issue and i don't think there's a necessarily an easy answer thank you eddie uh, derek please can't hear you derek Sorry, I was. We still can't hear you, Derek. Can you hear me now then? We can. Yes, right. Just just to say, following on from what uh, Lynn has been saying, it's a subject we've touched on in great depth in the past, uh, not the least Dr Pickering. It was one of his uh, favourite uh, things he was trying to take forward and uh, we, we never really got got the answer did we and uh, it seemed to be picking up from where we left off or even perhaps a little bit beyond that but uh, as possibly the uh, what is it the phrase uh, it's gone now longest serving member of of the uh, at this stage father of the house that's it <laughs> of, of the governors i mean it's always been on the agenda hasn't it and just shows really what a, a difficult topic it is, really, and uh, all the best for getting it sorted. Thank you, Derek. Um, David, please. Let me do it. Yes. Well, it's an interesting topic, but if you want to spend three hours, put it on the agenda. Well, we don't have three hours, David, so don't, uh, don't worry me with that one. <laughs> I, I was on David. Pickering's committee and what was interesting for me was to see the guy who was responsible for the support staff the guys that walk around security, security wise and he used to say and which which amazed me well, it's not in my contract. And once I heard that, it was lost. I was also a member, a trustee of Ashgate Hospice when this matter came up for about another three hours. And there, I'm afraid, some of Hal's point come into place. If you come in to a hospice to die and you're about to die, but one of your few pleasures in life is to smoke, it would be a very hard hearted organization that would not allow it. So I think what that came to pass was nothing was really very much done except they were concentrated in certain areas. Now, I was also at Chesterfield College where smoking was a bad problem. Now, we were able to resolve that by more or less saying, well, these are the rules of the establishment. If you don't want to get, if you, if you want to stay here, please adhere to them. We also appointed security staff, and the last guy who was appointed was about six feet eight. He was very effective. But I don't think there's any real solution other than everyone at the top 
of the pile at the hospital, and I'm looking at you, Helen, and you see your CEO and senior staff are able to go up to people with a firmness. I've tried it once or twice at uh, the hospital, and I got the standard answer. I don't think you're ever going to resolve it, but if you go to different parts of the country, you, you see that it has been affected because more people want it, not on the premises. But I think the only answer you're going to come to is probably saying what Hal was suggesting again. And the earlier part of what he talked, concentrate one area where people are allowed to smoke. If they don't do that, then you can, well, I don't know what you can do. You can't, if you come across someone who's really, really bloody minded, and we've got a few of them around in Chesterfield, as we know, you won't get anywhere. But we need we need a definite, strong reply. But Helen, I suspect in our time with COVID and everything else, it's big, big problems that they surmount the problems of smoking. But I would suggest you don't spend too much time on it because you won't necessarily get an answer unless the senior management from the very top do something about it. And also, when they sign in the next security staff, do what the college did. They put in something on that contract which said the security staff are expected to enforce the college policy of not smoking. So they couldn't say, as they said in the committee I was on, well, it's not in our contract. But it's very, very time consuming. But that's, that's what I've got to offer. But thank, I'm, thank I'm you for sharing those, um, those observations and your experience elsewhere, David, um, as it underlines no easy answers. So I'm going to have two more contributions on this and then we'll draw a line. So if I can go to Luke and Norman in that order, please. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Helen. Um, just a few comments to add on. Obviously, I was part of the big conversation uh, when it happened. Um, so great to see this come back, come back round. Um, one, just some of the points that I did know did come out of the big conversation was some people um, would like support in stopping smoking. Um, I don't know how effective it is, but I just wondered in the smoking shelters, um, if they're going to go ahead, um, could there be some support there just to suggest that if you do want to stop, um, speak to your health professional or or some just simple guidance like that. Um, so we're promoting stopping smoking where possible. That's a great, great suggestion. Uh, we'll take that one forward, uh, Luke. Thank you. And last but by no means least, Norman, please. Thank you, Helen. Um, when I go to see my GP or I come to the hospital and the staff are doing a history on me, generally one of the first questions is, do you smoke? So it obviously has a, a very harmful effect on, on the body, on the human body. Um, and yet I can't understand how patients are allowed to leave the ward to go to the front door, sometimes in a wheelchair with a drip attached and sit there having a cigarette. I, I just cut that that goes beyond me that that is a, is someone allows that the other thing is if patients see staff doing it or public see staff doing it then they say well it, if they can do it it's okay for us to do it we, we need to take the bull by the horns here and we need to enforce it and stop it it's a horrible thing i've seen it at other hospitals where i've been where I used to go regularly with janet we had to go through this cloud of smoke to get to where we wanted to be and it was awful we our close tank of, of smoke etc 
as far as the back quadrant, as I call it, the back entrance there, the signage is all out of date. The signage needs a good looking at. Um, I see people just actually leaning on a no smoking sign, smoking, and nobody says anything. And I, I agree with David, it should be in the contract of the security that they ask people, it's, it's a no smoking site, would you put cigarettes out? So there are ways of doing it. It is a difficult position. And I think the only way to do it is not provide shelters for people to smoke. They're only at the hospital for a certain period of time. I think they should be able to refrain and we should enforce that. Take the ball by the horse. It's not setting a good example at a place where we're trying to heal people and help people recover that we allow them to go out and have a cigarette. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Um, obviously, passionately held views for reasons we completely understand. Um, on the back of that discussion, I would suggest that uh, probably the best thing, um, if you're willing, Hal, is that you come back and perhaps give us a further update at the end of this pilot so that we can think about what it is that has achieved and uh, how many of these effects and difficult, thorny issues that has managed to resolve and how uh, any further thoughts we have on making sure it's not stopping our longer term goal and ambition about um, you know helping people um, stop smoking and um, making sure that we're not um, causing uh, any you know worsening of conditions because of um, you know our inability to get a grip on that element of public health. So thank you again for coming Hal, particularly at a time when there's so many calls on your time. Thank you and I can, I can certainly come back and, and report on on whether whether the pilot is successful or not. And I think we need to be flexible sometimes. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, we need to think again. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we're on the last lap and we're about to come to a very nice part of the meeting. Um, so just to say on item nine, issues from the governor's pre-meeting, we used our time together over a cup of tea before the meeting started, really just check in and see how we were all feeling. So there's no specific items to cover um, in respect of agenda item nine. On agenda item 10, governor feedback. Um, is there any governor who would like to raise any issue about where they've been or what they've seen or anything they want to share with the council? Margaret, please. You're on mute, Margaret. Right. Um, yeah, just to let people know that um, I, I'm still going to the um, engagement committee, the, you know, the system wide engagement committee. They've now renamed it to, to, to the Derbyshire engagement committee. And, uh, you know, yeah, I was on that call yesterday um, and there were, uh, you know, some, some interesting developments, but um, nothing, you know, nothing, nothing very uh, specific. Yeah. So, but, um, it is. A, <laughs> Gelling into quite a, a useful group to find out what's happening around in uh, in the wider area of Derbyshire. So if there's anything that uh, crops up um, more specifically, I'll uh, keep you informed. But just to let you know that those meetings are still going ahead, and uh, they, you know, so we're, we're really getting into quite a, a good system with those now. <clears throat> Thanks for that update, Margaret. Um, Luke, please. Yep, um, I guess it was just uh, to feedback on some feedback from the allied health professionals. Um, so, it, and it, kind of my role in the improvement team, it was raised by the um, allied health professionals that they would like to get more involved with some of the improvement programs. Um, quite, I was quite happy it wasn't the program that I lead in outpatients because they're well and truly embedded within that. Um, but we're going to work with, I'm going to work with the other program leads to make sure the allied health professionals are represented um, throughout the work and the improvement work that we do um, in the trust. So just to feed that back. Well done, thank you. Uh, Jane. Um, Helen, I've got a, I've got a response from um, Krishna to Pervez's question. Oh, well, well, if, you would, if you would like me to read it out, it's quite short. Are you doing real time feedback in action? I am, <laughs> I am. Go so it. she says the care accreditation scheme, assessment of care, excellence, ACE, is a multidisciplinary approach and we have AHPs as well as nurses undertaking the assessments. The assessments include review of all disciplines, medical, nursing, AHPs, pharmacists and their interaction with patients. This from, doc this forms doc this from documents as well as witnessed interactions as well as speaking directly to patients for their feedback. 
Both the chief nurse and medical director support the scheme as a quality and improvement methodology and as such attend the direct feedback on the day so that they can respond to any immediate concerns from any staff groups if required. There is always high level feedback on the day as well as written feedback to support any action plan for improvement. These are shared with the whole ward team. By the ward leaders, we mean senior medical and nursing leaders and AHPs. We can provide some more detail when we update COG members next. Very good question and equally good answer. So thanks to both you and Krishna, uh, Jane. Um, Norman, please. Hello, I'm not sure it's the right time to raise it, but um, I'm still being uh, seen in the house patients from my, my, by the trauma surgeon from my shoulder. And I was contacted by the patient hub about an appointment. It, tell, it gave me a date and it said, please use the buttons below to accept or decline or whatever. There was only one button and that was accept. So rather than lose the appointment, I accepted it. I couldn't attend on that date, but I had to accept it, which then generated a phone call for me to ring the, 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 um, the, the people who arranged the appointments and say, I'm sorry, I did accept it, but I can't make it. So I've had to ring you to change the date. So I think the message that's going out is generating phone calls where I think it, the idea is to stop the phone calls. And um, I just, I mentioned it to them. I don't know whether they're going to do anything about it, but it, it's just, I've had other people say to me, um, they've had the same issue. They can't get through. The appointments are coming through. They can't decline them. They can only accept them. So I don't, I don't know if they're going to do anything about it, but if you look in the chat, you can see the chief executive is going to do something about it. So um, that's a helpful okay. feedback. Thank you, Norman. Thank you. Um, now, we come to that point of the meeting when it's an opportunity for us to say um, a more personal um, thank you to Beverly and Alison. Um, obviously, we've done the formal recording for the minutes um, about their service at the start. But I know there are colleagues who would like to express thanks and appreciation as well as myself. So we're going to do that. I can't see either of you on screen at the moment. Um, now, if you'd say something, you might pop up in the middle of the screen, which would be rather nice if we could see you uh, whilst we're saying our thank you. I'm, I'm here, Helen. I can hear I'm, you. And is that you, Alison? I, I can't see Alison either, actually. I'm here. Oh, Alison, very good, very good. Um, well, it's nice uh, nice to hear you, even if I can't see you, and I hope maybe colleagues can see you. Um, you know, both of you have been such a joy to work with, and the fact that over nine years of distinguished service, you have never once lapsed in either your um, tenacity or your diligence or your enthusiasm or your ambition for the trust is a, is a sign not only of your commitment to our cause, but um, your own styles and approach and um, loyalty to the team. And it's been a real pleasure as a chair to be able to rely on such a strong board. And I think all of the board uh, would join with me in saying you have both been real role models in that regard. Um, the longest serving members but it has been fabulous as we've brought new members onto the board, um, myself included, arriving after both of you um, to just um, have that benchmark in terms of, you know, what good looks like. Um, it's been terrific and being able to rely on both of you with very, um, very important briefs. I mean, the performance and finance brief is an area that is, you know, has required a huge amount of attention and Alison's skills from her executive walk of life about really understanding risk management and really understanding change management and really understanding project management has brought a rigor and a discipline to those conversations. But it wouldn't be half as effective as it has been, was it not for us, uh, for Alison's ability to combine um, challenge and support in equal measure. Um, and I'm sure that's something others will comment on. That has been very deftly done, Alison. It really has. And, um, you know, you. I mean, I, I know both of you will miss the trust a lot and we will miss you a lot. 
but I think you can go with the great satisfaction of having been part of our journey from requires improvement to what I now describe as very good. I'm not sure it's a, a particular class, but I think it does describe where we're at. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, that you have been a huge part of, um, of making that happen. So particular thanks to both of you, but also to Alison in her chair of finance and performance and indeed the various other roles you've performed um, in the run up to us um, christening that committee with that particular title that had uh, forerunners. Um, and also to Beverly. I mean, Beverly, we're a small mid-sized, well, we're not, we're a mid-sized district general hospital um, with a charitable uh, funds um, uh, committee and approach that, uh, I mean, will be, I'm sure, the envy of uh, many a much bigger establishment. And that has not only been because of the rigor and discipline and indeed the commercial um, acumen you bring to um, examining all of those issues, but a deep commitment to patients and uh, a, a confidence in uh, calling out on behalf of the community and our other donors, uh, you know, what they might expect about that money being wisely invested and best spent. And I always say that Beverly is the only person I know that um, is as good a shopper as I am. Um, and she's been a fabulous shopper on behalf of the funds that our community have invested for the well-being of patients and staff. Uh, but I uh, don't say that flippantly because I know, Beverly, you've been a great pains to syndicate that through the trust so that people had some autonomy about that spend really locally in a way that was meaningful to patients, which of course was again a great innovation and a very sensitive and empathetic um, take on uh, discharging your functions. Um, so it's been fabulous to be able to rely on both of you. And I have to say, particularly Beverly, in your capacity as Sid, um, not least of all with everything you've done on freedom to speak up. Um, that's such a huge part of, uh, of a good culture in an organisation. And you've been enormously diligent about that in a very uh, quiet and discreet and discerning way, but one which has made us really go to the top of the league table and, um, you know, working alongside Abby in, in our whole approach to that. So we're enormously grateful to you. Uh, we'll miss you both hugely. Uh, we hope you will find reasons to come back. And of course, Beverly will, because Beverly um, is going to continue to convene um, our grouping of the great and good who will be advisors and supporters in, um, in the uh, wellbeing hub for staff working alongside Atul and supporting his endeavours as he takes over as the Char Charitable Funds Committee. Um, so we really appreciate that. And we hope that there will be other equally obvious opportunities, Alison, for us to see you um, as, as time goes on, uh, because you, know, you will be fondly remembered and your legacy will be remembered with all the appreciation and, um, and kind thoughts uh, that it so richly deserves. Um, so I'm going to only really say a few short words because I know there was others who wanted to get in, but I really felt moved to say all of that because it has been a huge personal pleasure. But uh, please let me pass the baton to Margaret on behalf of Governors because I know she too would like to add her vote of thanks. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Helen. Yes, I, I think, you know, on behalf of all the governors and certainly on my own behalf, I'd like to thank both Alison and uh, Beverly for everything that they've done. I mean, I can remember when I first started as a governor, um, turning up at, uh, at the council meetings, um, and there was always, you know, a friendly smile and a friendly face from people. You know, Alison is, is you know, she always has a smile on her face. I don't think I've ever seen Alison looking uh, looking down hearted. Um, always a cheery hello and a, a, you know a chat. Um, she's always supported the governor inductions. And one thing that always strikes me when Alison comes to um, our governor induction, she starts off her introduction about um, her own background and how she wants to feel. She wants to give something back to the NHS and. To be honest, she couldn't have given more back to the NHS than she has done in her role um, here at the Royal. Um, she's always been there, you know, to, to support everything that, that goes on. Um, and, you know, quite apart from her um, roles actually on the board, I think just, to, you know, her roles in general as just being a, um, a good support for the hospital has been marvellous. Um, in terms of Beverly, um, the same, same applies, um, but totally transformed the charitable funds 
um, I can remember going on to wards in the early days and he talked to staff and they said, oh, if only we could have so and so. And I said, well, have you approached charitable funds? Oh, what, what are charitable funds? Didn't know we had a, <laughs> had a charitable funds. And now, you know, it's completely transformed. Um, and that's all down to um, down to Beverly's hard work um, and the way she's dealt with that. And on a personal basis, I really do have to thank Beverly for the last few months since I've taken over from Denise. She's been really um, helpful to me in supporting me, in, um, learning the ropes, if you like, as, as the lead governor, um, not least in doing uh, Helen's appraisal, which is a bit <laughs> something that I haven't done an appraisal for a long, long time. <laughs> and I definitely need a little bit of help and guidance on that. So personal thanks to Beverly um, from me, but I'm sure all the governors would join me in, um, you know, thanking the, the pair of you for all the work you've done for the organisation, and we will miss you, and wish you all the best in in anything that you do in the future. Thank you, thank you Margaret. Thank you. And um, Jane, I know you wanted to um, to amplify some um, comments uh, from a board perspective. So uh, over to you. Um, so I know the I know the both kind of um, having a little bit of trepidation and embarrassment this afternoon and uh, wanted minimal fuss but we have, we have to make, make sure that you go with the, the right level of thanks so um, I'm going to read something that I've written for both of you because um, one I wanted to make sure that the right sentiments were conveyed on behalf of all of the NEDs and, uh, and two I just didn't want to miss anything out so um, I'll try not to embarrass you. I promise that I wouldn't. And uh, so just bear with me and I think you'll find a co common theme. So we'll start with Alison. So I've known Alison as a Ned even before Chesterfield Royal, going back to PCT days. You've always been the same, Alison, respectful and thoughtful in how you've approached the role. You've always been careful to manage the support and challenge aspects of the role. And your expertise is absolutely way beyond what many people will see in terms of your um, uh, skill in finance and the digital sphere for us. And your questions at board are always razor sharp and absolutely hit the spot. It's been an absolute pleasure to have worked alongside you. The fact that I know you'll be embarrassed by the limelight precludes further praise. But we all know what a fabulous job you've done and how difficult it will be to replace your nine years of expertise. Um, so we just want to say thank you, Alison, for all that you've given to the Trust. CRH is undoubtedly a better place for your nine years of effort. Well, that was for Alison. And I know that the girls have got um, gift bags, which we might come to in a moment, Helen, um, with them from, uh, from the board and staff members, etc. Beverly, I try not to embarrass you too much. So, Beverly. I remember when I first met Beverly, I was in absolute awe of her life achievements. And now I find myself stepping into her shoes and hopefully I can manage to kind of conv convey the same sentiments in the role of Sid and deputy chair that and that Beverly has done. She's, you've been such a role model and supporter of new NEDs. And for that, I'm personally grateful, as I know many of my colleagues are. Your influence and the trust is widespread, not just with board and assurance matters and visits, etc. But we can't not mention your support of Freedom to Speak Up and the Charity Committee. And of course, Webster lives on and we'll continue to see you in some role. Your strength of feeling for staff and health wellbeing is well known. And this has been so important most recently. You're always ahead of the curve. And for that, I do admire you. You are so respected by colleagues for being a, a steadfast and and steady, a steady influence, but above all, an innovator. And for that, CRH has much to be grateful for. What else to say? Really just to say that CRH is a totally different place from the night from nine years ago. And this has to be in part due to your influence and your contribution. We'll miss you so much. And so thank you on behalf of all staff, patients and everyone at the Trust. Thank you very much, Jane, um, and more applause all round as we can see. Now, ladies, I don't want to embarrass you, but we're not going to let you go without some sort of little mini speech, um, even if, if it's just to say your farewells. Um, so, um, Alison, can I go to you first? Thank you, Helen. 
Um, it's really interesting what Margaret said, and I really want to say thank you to you and to all of the governors. Um, when I do do the governor induction, I tell the story about my two boys and how ill they were when they were born and the fact that the NHS supported us. And that has always been my motivation in, in being a, a, a NED in the NHS is to, to say thank you for the care that they and my family have had and, uh, and to give something back. So thank you for mentioning them. Um, I'm sure I will be in and around the hospital. I'm hoping I won't be doing my usual mystery shopping through A&E, um, but if I am, I'm sure I'll be giving feedback to Berenice and Angie. The signs on the walls are still saying funny things. Um, so I do hope it will be pleasant visits rather than visits to uh, to A and E. Um, and I think I'd just like to say thank you to to Elaine and Nick as well. I can still remember and have reminisced with both of them when I came in for my <laughs> and sitting on the blue chairs in the outer office there. Um, and we've always had to joke that that's actually my office because I used to come and sit and do my emails and phone calls. Um, after they'd made me a cup of tea. Um, very wazzy tea, Nick, wasn't it? I, I very. Like <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you all, with all of the council governors and the exec. Um, it's, uh, I will miss it. I will miss it. But I will come back and say hello. So thank you to everyone for all your support. And I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you so much, Alison. Alison, have you had a chance to open your gift? I, I was instructed not to. Would you, so would you like? Would you like? Would you like, to, would you like to have a little peek? Well, I was told Alison, I had to open the envelope first. That really Thank you. <laughs> I do hope it hits the spot, Alison. I do hope it hits the spot, Alison. Somebody tips us <laughs> off kindly. I don't know, Jane. If well, it's got doggies on the card, so that's already that's already a good thing. Jane took a lot, <laughs> a, a lot of advice on this matter, Alison. So we hope uh, we hope it's something you'll have to treasure for years to come. <laughs> no, that's really really lovely. Alison, do you want to say what it is? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, no. Um, so my husband and I have a tradition that we buy paintings of, of uh, dogs that look like our dogs. So we've got a uh, Springer Spaniel picture and a chocolate, uh, chocolate Cocker Spaniel picture. But our current dog is a really weird colour. Um, she's like a spotty cream tan. And we always thought we'd never, ever get a photograph or a picture of her or a dog like her. But your present is a photograph um, to be made of our dog that we can then buy. Uh, have a canvas of which means she can sit on our walls and we can remember her so um yeah i'll think of you all whenever i see her picture so and village so and village, so villager gin as i understand absolutely <laughs> absolutely i uh, yeah i'll have to talk to simon about taking the day off work to make her behave because she doesn't do anything i tell her to so uh, it might have to be a family outing with villager gin <laughs> i wondered so if we should I wondered, Alison, if we should have added dog grooming into it so she was looking her top tip top best when she goes to the what my husband has been calling the photography session. <laughs> no, she always looks a mess. So, um, yeah, I'll have to take the grooming bush. But thank you so much. That's really kind. Well, thank We're you. Glad you again, Alison. With, with, we're glad you're thrilled, Alison. We've had to take a lot of counsel because not being a dog lover myself, I was slightly anxious about this one. <laughs> um, Beverly, let's come to you, please, if we may. Any thoughts or reflections you want to share with us? Well, first of all, thank you for, for all the kind words. I mean, for me, working at Chesterfield, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. It's been fascinating, rewarding but equally challenging and at times incredibly frustrating. Uh, it's really interesting as, as you're looking now for new nets, when I reflected on what I would bring to the role and I thought in my previous business in coal mining and finance, the common threads were quality, risk management, regulation, investment development of staff, managing capital projects. And the NHS of course has all of those elements, but the fundamental difference was I used to produce a product or a service knowing who my customer was and knowing I'd make a profit. 
We don't have the luxury of that in the NHS. We, pro we provide quality, quality in staff, quality in equipment. And I really take my hat off to our exec colleagues for, for the work they deliver. This is the most incredibly complex business. And I was just thinking this morning, in my nine years, I've worked with two chairs, three chief executives, 21 executives, dozens of governors, 14 NEDs, and without doubt, every one of those people is, has a passion for Chesterfield, and it's, it's fantastic to see that passion continue. And if I think about, I mean, I think about the NEDs, and we've been incredibly lucky to have some really diverse talent. And I hope that our exec colleagues feel that we've always been constructive. I'm sure at times we've been incredibly irritating, but where we do all of us collectively challenge it now, I think more than ever, is celebrating our success. And I do think we've got success in bucket modes, particularly the way we communicate with our patients, with empathy, the way we communicate with our staff. And the strides we've made in changing the culture is really quite remarkable if I look back over nine years. I remember when we first introduced patient stories, and I will to add this before you, Helen, we only heard the bad news. And then we said, no, this isn't right. It's not sending the right message to staff. And the staff responded with a video. And from memory, there were 17 staff who get, had the opportunity to voice their successes. And the cascade of that positivity throughout the, the trust is immeasurable. And I do think we've continued that culture. And if I think a turning point was listening in action, we truly started to listen to our staff, to their innovation, to their ideas. And I'm really proud of the role that charitable funds played in that because we could react quickly. They came forward with ideas, we could fund them, hundreds and hundreds of projects, millions of pounds. But, but not just making difference to patients, but making staff felt heard, heard and, and, and valued. So I'm delighted that, that I will stay involved chairing the development community. I really want to see the staff have a success. I'm delighted to share with you that the Duke of Devonshire is, is going to be a patron of our appeal and our launch event will be held at Chatsworth. So we're really getting off to a fantastic start. So it's not a complete goodbye. It is a goodbye to governors and fellow directors. And just thank you. Thank you for the opportunity I've had. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly. And now, Beverly, you absolutely have to open your present. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing a photograph of it, and I'd like to time I'd like to come to a timeshare arrangement with you on it. It's absolutely lovely. Have a so, so I have to admit that this this has travelled all 3,000 uh, kilometres with me to Spain. I promise you I didn't even look at the name of the bag and I've just looked at, at what Kathy Stevens does. So I've, I've got a hint of what's in it. Thank you so much, everybody. This is, it would be so nice to be with you in person to do this, but here I am. I'm going to rip it and I'd just like to rip them. A box within a box. Oh, that's wow, that is beautiful. How lovely is that? Thank you so much. I still I love wearing that and thinking of you all. I believe, I believe, Jane, that you uh, commissioned it and it's been handmade. Is that right? It is. It is hand. It is handmade by a lady who designs jewellery individually. Um, yeah. So yes. Yeah. Well, wear, so wear, wear it and remember us. And Alison, um, put your picture of your your dog on the wall and remember us. But don't be strangers. Um, Helen. Helen, can you just go to Nick? I think Nick's got something else for them. Oh, yes. yes. Now that now the challenge Annika budget didn't run to where you two have escaped to, but I do have <laughs> two bottles of champagne here for you from some of your colleagues as well. So you will have to come back and see us one day. Uh, but all the very best. It's been lovely working with you both for the last nine years. Wow. Well, it's been lovely well, working thanks. with you, Nick. And I was expecting the doorbell to ring. I thought. Right, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, the, this, the, the cards, care. the cards. Sorry, Helen. The cards are also with Nick, with everyone's um, good wishes in them as well. And I'm sure flowers didn't seem appropriate when they were on holiday. We thought they would appreciate champagne better. So. <clears throat> But, but thank you all again thank you. Uh, for being with us today and a particularly uh, a warm thank you um, to Alison and Beverly and all the very best. So we'll release you onto your afternoons and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Judith, we'll see if we get left.